Hello and welcome to The Doc Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Mike DeLuke, and it's my mission to help you lead a happier, healthier, and more prosperous life, both personally and professionally. Hello and welcome to this episode of The Doc Podcast. As you just heard in the show opening, my mission is to help you lead a happy and healthy life, both personally and professionally. And today's guest is someone who's going to help you in both of these areas. I have the pleasure of being joined by an amazing physical therapist, Kevin McLaughlin. Kevin is a graduate of Ithaca College and was a member of their very first master's degree program. He's practiced physical therapy for 30 years, with 28 of those years spent in private practice, and the last eight years as co-owner of McLaughlin Judd Physical Therapy in Gilderland, New York. In 2011, Kevin obtained certification in the McKenzie Method, also known as MDT, which we will talk about more during the show. His practice specializes in treating mechanical disorders of the spine and extremities, as well as sports medicine, geriatrics, and post-surgery rehabilitation. On a personal note, Kevin has helped me work through aches and pains and injuries during my time in private practice. Uh, those of you who know me know that I push my body very hard physically. And when I was younger, I could get away with it. But as I got into my mid thirties and was sitting with my head down, using all those fine motor skills all day, both chair side with patients and typing on the computer, and then would go put myself through a really hard workout all too often without the proper warm up or stretching, I began to have some issues. Kevin was amazing at diagnosing my issues and not only helping me become pain-free, but truly rehabilitating my injuries. Since starting as his patient, probably about 15 or so years ago, uh, he's become a trusted resource and friend and absent his choices in sports teams, really is a great (laughs) all-around guy. (laughs) So with that, I would like to welcome Kevin McLaughlin to the Doc Podcast. Welcome, Kevin. Mike, thanks for having me. A uh, great intro. I know I'm the I'm uh, the rarity of a Boston sports fan stuck in the capital district of uh, New York <laughs> State. So it's a, uh, it's a struggle. The struggle yeah. is real. Yep, and Notre Dame too, right? And Notre, well, you know, I'm Irish. That's a yeah. it's an uh, obligation. <laughs> yeah, you know, I actually found out recently through a sibling doing a um, doing one of the genetic analyses that, that I have yeah. Irish. I, all these years really? we've known each other. Yeah, I didn't know. I was I have actually a decent <laughs> amount too. So um, something that could be the best party. I could. Be. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, just kind of a little bit more background. I mean, sure. <clears throat> most people know that proper posture, ergonomics, whether well, they didn't, they might not know how to implement it, but conceptually um, is really important. But most don't know that dental professionals, dentists, hygienists, assistants. We don't learn this stuff in school. So you may have had an instructor that, you know, was kind of in tune to it. So tell you in preclinic or something, sit up straight, or they'd kind of walk around and try to help you and give you general rules like knees at 90 degrees, hips straight or upright, sitting upright over your hips and um, feet flat on the floor. Don't crane your neck, all those sorts of things. But it, it was more passive recommendations. It wasn't really actively enforced. I and mean, we certainly didn't have times where you were you know, looked at or graded or judged based on your posture and, and, and how you were sitting with the patient. And since there's no one actively working with the students or residents to ensure the proper posture and ergonomics, we develop really bad habits. And once we develop those in our training, it's really hard to undo them, especially because as you get out into practice, now you're just seeing more patients, more volume, more time, more pressure, more stress. So you just keep doing it and sometimes even worse. You start getting worse posture and, and worse habits. And then you add an age, which is kind of what happened with me. I actually always use loops, even as an orthodontist, a lot of orthodontists don't wear the magnification. I always did. I actually always had knock on wood. I never had any problems with my neck or anything. I always had pretty good upright posture, but for me, it was just, just as age set in and how hard I pushed my body outside of my practice. I just started having these, these issues. So, I mean, people don't understand that dentistry, it's a grueling profession physically. I mean, and I'm going to, in a minute, I wanted you to talk about it from your side and what you see, because it's at the point where a lot of people, a lot of dentists experience chronic pain to the point that, I mean, substance abuse, depression, even suicide with some of them tied into a lot of that because of this pain. And it applies to assistants, hygienists, dentists. uh, And we end up not doing a lot proactively to try to help ourselves be better at this, but then we try to be reactive. And then that's where the substance abuse and, and all of those things can, can factor in. So sure. I want to just kind of give that background to everybody because I, I'm 
there are a lot of people who may who listen to the show who aren't maybe necessarily dental professionals and just wondering why this is relevant, but it, I think it applies to a lot of what we're going to talk about isn't necessarily even just for dental professionals. It's kind of just the ergonomics of how what we should be doing, especially because so many of us are, at, even if we're not dentists, we're at computers all day. We're, we're sitting sure. in a lab all day. We're on our phones all day. Whatever it is, we're, we're using that fine motor and then we're not going out and then we're going out and using our bodies in other ways and breaking down. So before we dive into that, just give me a little background about you, uh, how you got into this career and, and what it's, what it's like being a PT. What is it, what is it like yeah. in your profession? Well, I, I got, uh, I got into physical therapy cause I, um, I was a athlete in high school, you know, nothing, nothing special, but I played a lot of sports. Uh, I, I suffered a back injury playing basketball, um, had to go for physical therapy. And at the time, you know, this is in the, uh, you know, mid to late eighties physical therapy was, you know, I don't know if it was how advanced it was. I, you know, I received standard stuff, hot packs, mm-hmm. ice packs, stim, mm-hmm. massage, some general stretching advice. And, you know, being 16, I think I would have healed regardless of going to physical therapy. Mm -hmm. Um, But I I thought, Hey, this seems like an easy job, but didn't seem that difficult to put hot packs on people and rub their Mm -hmm. backs. And um, because prior to that, I thought of going to education. Everybody in my family has been a teacher. My grandmother, my my mother's a teacher's assistant. My sisters are in that route, that uh, profession. So um, I thought I would just kind of follow, follow suit. Um, So looked into physical therapy, learn more about it. And, uh, quickly realized after being in school that there's more to it than just hot packs and, and stim. And, you know, ironically enough, uh, coming from a background of, of teachers, I spend a lot of my day educating my patients. Uh, mm. I'm, I'm a teacher by default, almost. It's a great point. Um, and I can attest to that from being your patient. Yeah, mm-hmm. Be- yeah because I mean, like, you know, like what you guys do, if, if you don't teach your patients, not only what the fix is, but how to, how to maintain it, how to manage their problem. They become either very dependent or they become non-compliant patients. Mm-hmm. And we don't want either. We want people mm-hmm. that are independent with their own care and um, compliant with that because it's helpful. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so uh, I did my PT school, um, worked in a rehab hospital, which is Sunnyview here up in Schenectady for a couple of years. Um, that's where I met my wife, you know, uh, who was an OT at the time. Um, and that's also where Renee did her OT. One yeah, of the similarities correct, yes. which we've talked about that Renee yeah, did her so OT they met, they met each field other work at years ago. Yeah. Yep. And uh, and then uh, you know joined a private practice and eventually was lucky enough to be able to um, purchase one of their locations and that's where I've been ever since. Um, I got into McKenzie. Uh, I've been doing some other uh, practice approaches um, that were very hands-on and manual therapy, which would help some patients. And it was cool when you could kind of move somebody and get a little crack or a pop. You kind of get that rush of, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm doing something helpful here. But I started getting burnt out because I was getting patients that weren't getting better. I was getting patients mm-hmm. that were too large to, to mobilize mm-hmm. or move. Or um, I was injuring myself with my body mechanics mm-hmm. because I yeah, couldn't yeah. get in positions to, to move mm-hmm. these people. And so I actually considered just leaving the profession because I just mm. felt like this is this is a challenge. And you know, my dad's words of wisdom were you put all this time and money and invested into this per profession to just walk away, you know. So I sat on it, um, kept working, and I was introduced to a therapist, my actually who's now my business partner, Dennis Judd, who is a McKenzie certified therapist. And he introduced me to McKenzie and it kind of opened my eyes up because. I didn't have to put my hands on patients every single time they came in. I didn't have mm. to use modalities. I just had to examine, I had to evaluate them. I had to think critically. Mm. And I think my brain likes, I like puzzles and patients are puzzles waiting to be solved. Mm-hmm. The, the, the solution is in them if you ask the right questions. So rather than just kind of a generic, oh, you have back pain, here's a hot pack, here's some stretches. Tell me about your back pain. What makes it better? What makes it worse? Um, and, and that's kind of, you know, where I'm at now, where I spend most of my day, almost every session, even if it's a follow appointment, is a reevaluation of somebody because you yeah. want to see improvement from session to session. Yeah. So that's kind of been my journey. You know, I'm, I'm very happy doing mechanical care, musculoskeletal conditions. I don't do neurologic rehab. I don't do wound care. I don't use a ton of modalities. Mm-hmm. Um, literature is you know, not so supportive of that in most cases mm-hmm. and insurance companies don't really pay you for them anyway. Um, so it's a lot of hands-on education, exercise, um, and just constant reassessment and a lot of, um, encouragement, a lot of coaching goes into our jobs too. Yeah. I, again, I can attest to all of that from being your patient. And it's funny that you became certified in 2011. I think I probably came to you for the first time, right, right, right around then, give or take, uh, and that was one of the first things I, you, I don't know if you remember it, but you said to me, um, 
we had a conversation about it because I was kind of like, oh, are you going to do, it was like East Dim or Ultra, I think Ultrasound. And uh, cause I had seen, I think someone else that was in your, that office at the time, cause there were multiple therapists. And, and yeah. then I ended up with, you, you were the one that had I'd been referred to, but I think based on schedules, I couldn't see you right away. So I had seen somebody else and, and you're like, no. And you're like, you're, and I remember you saying, you said the modalities are not the answer to getting you better. They might get you out of pain. They might make you feel a little better, but I want to get at the mechanical etiology of this and try to yeah. figure out why you're here and get you to the point that you're not here anymore. And it was the first time I'd ever really heard that. And it's so in line with my philosophy from as an orthodontist, because as you know, the residents I teach or people who've taken my courses know, I'm huge on get to the root cause of things. Sure. Don't just yeah. jump to the treatment in our in our profession, the modality, quote unquote, kind of be you know the braces or whatever you're doing to kind of mm. perform that. And, and, and it's not a direct analogy, but it's it's doing the treatment versus getting at first the true cause of what's going on. Well, there's a lot of things will offer relief, right? But yeah, we want yeah. to see improvement. Because yeah. that was, 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 was frustrating me is a patient would feel better when they get off my table, but they wouldn't come back better. And oh, at the next visit, got it. The next visit. Okay. And that's yeah. that's kind of frustrating because because if you if a patient doesn't see improvement in the first couple of visits, either your approach isn't working, or maybe they have something that's a little more serious has to be addressed, but they're going to lose interest and they're going to drop out. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what kills your practice is just the self discharge, self dropout. So that's still mm -hmm. going to happen for any number of reasons, whether it's co pays or timing, people's schedules, their life gets busy. Um, but if a patient comes back on the second visit and they can tell me I'm about 25% better, they're, they're going to be more engaged in their recovery mm -hmm. and you need an engaged patient. Like I'm yeah. sure you've worked with patients. Like if they're not doing the simple things you ask them to do, you're not going to have success. Absolutely. Right? They, yeah. they got to be engaged. Yep. So if you give somebody day one, they come back like, man, those simple exercises really seem to help me. Or I, okay, now I understand why I'm having this pain. As you point this out to me, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. Now they become an active participant in their care, not a passive recipient. Mm -hmm. And that's very much PT at times has been very, passive delivery of passive modalities that lay on the table, get their stem, get their hot pack, and they feel good for that 20 minutes. Right, right. Then they come back. And most patients out, they if they want stem, I tell them 60 bucks on Amazon, you can buy yourself a 10 unit, use whatever you want. <laughs> you don't have to come, you don't have to pay a copay to lay on my table for 15 minutes, get a hot pack and stem. It's yep. the same device. Yeah. Just doesn't plug into the wall. Yeah. That's that's interesting. And then when you did that, just more from my curiosity, yeah. was that were you an outlier in that, in the area uh, at that time or in your profession, or is this kind of well, more normal that people do this now? Well, I think there's, there's more McKenzie practitioners now than there were, you know, probably a decade or so ago when I, you know, started doing it. Um, it's, it's become more universally recognized as a um, evidence driven treatment approach. Mm. And um, it's very cost effective for a lot of patients too. Mm -hmm. What I did find when I started switching my philosophy to, Hey, I'm not just going to treat your pain. We're going to try to fix your problem. Mm -hmm. um, you, you, you lose some patients because they're, mm -hmm. they like the hot pack and the massage and the ultrasound, even though they, they tell you're not really getting better. They like how yep. they feel when they leave. Yep. So that was a little bit of a ego blow that I had to adapt to, but I, I knew it, it the time and effort I put into it, if I didn't stick with it and just dabbled in it, I wouldn't be any good. Mm -hmm. So everything I do now is based off of the, the McKenzie assessment, the mechanical assessment, and then treat based upon that. Even if it's an extremity issue, like we treated with you, there's a mechanical component of it at some point. Now, if a person comes in with inflammation, there might be some modalities that are necessary sure, sure. Um, to calm that down. But yep. if they're in acute distress, usually you want to use your analgesics and SEDs, ice, and let it rest. Mm -hmm. relatively speaking, before you started doing aggressive or, or um, uh, involved treatment. So there is a place for that. But someone comes in, you know, they strain their back six, seven, eight weeks ago, and they have intermittent pain that comes and goes based upon certain activities. They're not in, they're not inflamed. Mm -hmm. They have a mechanical mm -hmm. problem. Yep. You know, the, uh, the, the analogy I'll use for, for some patients, whether it's uh, spinal stuff or a shoulder joint is imagine you had a pebble in your shoe and Every day when you're sitting, you don't, your foot feels fine. You start walking, the foot starts hurting because the pebble's pushing into your foot. Mm -hmm. So you sit down. Oh, I feel better. Mm -hmm. Pebble's still there waiting for you, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You got to get rid of the pebble. If you get rid of what's driving the pain, sometimes it's very straightforward. Sometimes there's, you know, psychosocial factors that play into it as well. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you, being a dentist, you know, all about fear avoidance, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, we see, <laughs> we see a lot of it in, in what we do. And it's interesting. I wonder if 
I looking back and kind of on this journey I'm on now to teach my colleagues to be more proactive in their treatment. And so much for so long, orthodontia has been a very reactive profession, right? We kind of wait and watch things and then try to clean it up when people are adolescents. And I remember we would even have conversations in the office and I was telling you, I was treating kids younger and you're like, really braces at like six, seven, uh, because it's yeah. just, it, we don't even think about that. And it, but it's that sort of same philosophy that you use with the McKinsey Institute information <laughs> is you're trying to get at the, the, the cause of the problem, the true etiology, and make it so that you're not just treating the symptom. And uh, it's amazing the right. parallel, and it's probably why, again, uh, we just have always kind of jived and had that sort of a connection as, as we've both often talked at, at my visits over the years. Um, yeah. The other thing is, is I can attest to the fact that at first, when it's not just the modalities, you don't leave, you leave liking you less when it's when it's the way you do it that works <laughs> because you leave and i'm like i go to drive I'm like my because with me full this my main thing was yeah. like my supinator and in my um yeah. drive better than me but being uh, 90 degrees with my arms all day and then going and lifting heavy and boxing and all the things i do uh it would just it would just flare it up and so you would yeah. put me in the big thing you uncovered with me is you're not going into end range like ever yeah. and you're losing yeah. your mobility and you're getting all this scar tissue and all these issues because you're staying out of end range. And some of it had to do with previous baseball injuries and, you know, boxing and stuff. But you, you, yeah. you're like, I remember you saying to me, this is nothing that you need any major correction for. You just have to get your full range of motion back. And yeah. that was really refreshing. But again, when you leave your office after you put me through end range stuff for the first time, you know, you're like, whoa, you know, you feel it. But like you said, after a few visits, all of a sudden he starts going, oh my gosh, like, I, it doesn't hurt anymore. Things are, things yeah. are not. and you were very astute to the fact that it wasn't an injury per se. I mean, I guess technically maybe, but but it was just more of a, of a chronic issue. And, and on that, what do you recommend for, there's always a big debate, um, ice, when, I mean, you kind of alluded to like first 48 hours, but sure. after that, yeah, really no benefit. Uh, well, I mean, first of all, I got to say having a dentist tell me that he liked me less leaving a, a visit is hurts. I mean, that's that right into the heart with that one, Mike, um, but I'll, I'll take it. I'm a, I'm a big enough man to take it. So yeah, I mean, we generally speaking, end, so. you know, 48 <laughs> ends justify the means exactly uh, yeah 48 72 hours after after an acute injury uh you know ice is usually necessary and, and helpful um but after that you know i think it depends upon how the symptoms are responding to the stress is it is it intermittent pain you know people mm -hmm. who have intermittent pain typically don't don't have inflammation that's active at that point they don't need ice uh, and or heat it's usually driven by some movement or posture um yeah i, I usually generally tell people if you just kind of feel stiff sore achy um in the area doesn't feel warm or aggravated, you know, heat should be fine. If you feel like it's a new pain or you've re-injured yourself or there's swelling that's either palpable or visible, um, feels like an aggravation, you can go with ice. Most of the time, um, uh, people can kind of try one or the other, not have much adverse effect. Mm -hmm. um, I don't use a lot in a clinic just because it's a, it's a, it wastes time that's spent better spent on listening to the patient, doing mm -hmm. my examination, my reassessment, my testing, yep. you know, we'll talk about kind of what we actually do to establish you know, baselines, but um, I don't discourage people unless, you know, let's say someone with a total knee replacement, you know, three days out and their leg is on, you know, hot to the touch and swollen. I'm telling them, obviously you've got to keep icing this thing for at least a good, you know, another five, seven days before mm -hmm. you worry about anything else. Um, so it's, it's almost situational dependent. Um, more because since we do so much more mechanical type problems, heat or ice typically don't have much benefit or negligent effect with those type of patients. It's more the acute stuff where we worry about the application of heat. In my in my experience, okay, yeah, because I remember being surprised by that when I was saying like, hey, I'm kind of icing," and you're like, "With your situation, it's not this acute thing. You have this chronic issue of." overuse and, and using those fine motor skills all day and then going using the big muscle groups, uh, yeah. at, at night or on the weekends or, or whatever. So, uh, well, a lot of times too, like if people are telling me that, you know, it only hurts when I do certain things. And if I let it rest within 15, 20 minutes, it goes away. That's again, that's, that's more mechanical than is inflammatory. Mm -hmm. Inflammatory is going to be constant hurts all the time. Nothing makes it better. Everything makes it worse. Then by all means, I sit relative rest, let that, let that fire die out before you start doing things. Mm -hmm. So it's, that's why we ask patients not, Oh, do you have pain? Yes or no. But tell me about the behavior of your pain. What makes it better? What makes it worse? Is it intermittent? Is it constant? Cause that tells us a lot about the type of problem we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. Also, how long have you had it? Oh, I've had this elbow pain for six months. 
you might have chronic inflammation. More than likely, you've got you know blood vessels and nerve endings that are growing into places into the tendon that it shouldn't grow, and that's what's causing your mechanical pain. Um, icing and heating just palliative at best at times. Mm-hmm. In, in that case, mm-hmm. yeah. On the level of what uh, dental providers, or really again anybody who's sitting in, which is a lot of people today, occupationally sitting in a position, but especially den- dental providers, because we are so, I guess let's kind of take it in a couple of ways. First, we'll go just with the general posture before we get into the wrists and the, the um, fine motor stuff, but just general, from a general postural perspective, how yeah. should we be sitting to have the best ergonomics <laughs> to minimize our risk of problems as we go through our years in the profession? Yeah. You know, I, I- one of the best dental hygienists I ever had um, did her entire treatment of me standing. And it was the only time I'd ever seen that. And I commented to her, I'm like, wow, you, you're ahead of the curve here because this is going to be so much less stressful for your back and shoulders than kind of being hunched over. And she said, yeah, you know, I, I kind of vary. I'll do some sitting, some standing, but I'd never had any other dentist or dental professional ever do that. Hmm. I don't know if it maybe it's not always feasible with some of the devices that you guys use, but um. But as far as sitting posture, you know, it's it's hard because you guys are going to be in awkward positions, usually coming over a a, a patient's shoulder at an angle, um, having to kind of reach up and around or over. So it's hard to be in ideal posture. Um, Mm -hmm. What I usually try to tell my dentists I've worked with and hygienists is as best as you can regularly interrupt that posture by moving into the opposite direction. If your head is forward, your shoulders are rounded, sit up straighter, pull your shoulders back, lift your head up and just take a breath, take a pause, right? Mm -hmm. Interrupt that position. Um, As best as you can, you want to kind of make sure that you're hinging from the hips, not slumping from the shoulders when you're working with a client Um, and trying not to be, you know, twisted too much. If you can, it's about, Mm -hmm. can you position yourself in a way where you have access to the, your, your patient's, um, mouth, but still be in a good ergonomic position. And Mm -hmm. sometimes unfortunately it's going to be a Mm trade-off, but if you recognize, okay, I just spent 15, 20 minutes in this position, I'm going to stand up, do some scapular squeezes, roll my shoulders back, you know, lift my chest up. You can sometimes combat that. It's Mm -hmm. the lack of recognition that you're doing this over and over and over again. Yeah. That leads to problems that, that repetitive uh, use type of injury, repetitive stress, micro trauma, and then aging of tissue as we get older too. It's not as resilient. It's not as malleable, mm-hmm. unfortunately. Yeah. And, and just to kind of break it up for people, the, I guess there's kind of, well, correct me if I'm wrong, but as I see it, there's a few categories. There's what you can do just every day to keep yourself limber and healthy and agile uh, and so that you're able to do this. There's the things you can do <clears throat> during it. Um, well, I guess I should back that up. There's things you used to tell me to do prior, like in the morning, you would tell me certain hand stretches and neck stretches and things to do. Because a lot of times, especially if you're in a cold weather climate, you walk in cold and within minutes you're sitting at that chair in a static position um, and and you're not doing any stretching or anything. Uh, And then you would tell me about, so there were things you could do kind of prior or during the day, like lunchtime or at the end of the day. And, And there's those things that you can do with patients which I started doing too, like the, you know, squeezing your scapula together and kind of you know, getting your neck back and just it, in every, all of us have a moment at the chair where you can do that. I mean, not every moment, but there are times at which you can just take a breath and get that. So if you could break that down sure. into those three areas for us, just some of the things you can do proactively, some meaning like in the big picture, not just in yeah. the office, some things you can do before patients and then some things you can do during patients. I think you bring up a good point about like just the, you know, the, the health of the individual that's providing the care, right? Because y- y- no patient wants to see, um, in my case, their physical therapist with lousy posture, kind of hunched over. Um, it, you kind of have to look the part, right? Mm-hmm. You don't, you don't want to see a dentist with you know, crooked teeth and, right. you, know, mm-hmm. you know, missing, you know, cavities and, you know, whatever sores. So you kind of have to have to look the part. So I think, you know, outside of work, um, general fitness and especially strengthening exercises. You know, you wouldn't think of dental work or hygienist work as something that demands strengthening, but if you're hunched over or rounded shoulder most of the day, your periscapular muscles are working so hard to take stress off your shoulders. Mm -hmm. They're going to fatigue and weaken. Your pec muscles might get tight from being bent over. Mm -hmm. Um, Some of the dentists that I've treated over the years, uh, when they're later in their career, even retired, they have Mm -hmm. very kyphotic rounded shoulder, forward head postures, their spines mm-hmm. almost like question marks. Mm-hmm. And kind of by then it's a little bit too late. You know, they, they can't lay down flat without their head tilting back. They're so stiff. Mm-hmm. So 
you know, strengthening your upper back muscles, periscopic muscles, stretching your, your, your chest muscles, anterior shoulder, um, you know, making, uh, making sure you work on, uh, straightening the elbows to the end range like we talked mm -hmm. about with you because your elbows mm -hmm. are bent at mid-range all the time mm -hmm. um your finger flexors are working all day long your wrist flexors so you know stretching into extension and then strengthening in the opposite direction so mm -hmm. I, my general advice to people is try to stretch what's tight and strengthen what's weak so stretching the muscles in the front of your body or in the front of your hands and forearms that you're going to get shorter because of the constant position and then strengthen the opposite muscle group um yeah, including your, you know, your, your spinal extensors, because we spend so much time in the opposite position. And this is any type of seated job, um, any type of job where you're bent over for periods of time, you know, this is kind of just general advice. And then, you know, during the day or with in between clients, just the, you know, stretch breaks, just take a break from that position. Mm -hmm. Um for the tools, you know, I don't know, you probably know this better than I, but, you know, can the tools be adapted to have thicker handles or thicker grips? So mm. they're not quite, you have to pinch quite as hard. Mm. Um, you know, are they teaching different techniques in school where you can um, not have to use as much force, you know, when you're using these tools? Like these are mm -hmm. things I don't know a lot about, you know, mm -hmm. you know better than me, but that's, you know, if I'm working with a mechanic, I'm telling the same thing. Like, can you get tools that have, you know, grips on them. So they're it absorb some of the shock of those, mm. of the, that tool, um, things like that. So I think it's, um, it's, it's important that people realize that, you know, there is some preventative stuff that can be done to mitigate. I don't think you never eliminate mm -hmm, injuries sure. in, in the type of work that you do, but you can mitigate the, the extent of them for sure. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, on that, on the, um, two things, is it possible at, after before I launched the show live, could you send me some exercises, the a link to some or or even just sure. some PDFs that I could just link to the show or our website yeah. if you know there's a good website to go to, um, just for some of those stretches that you find work for dental professionals? Is that or, yeah? What I could do, I'll just use our exercise program here, maybe put together like some just again. This is very general. I'm not giving yeah, any advice no, no, about no, what works, what doesn't work, yeah. but some general stretches. Um, and I'll just email it to you um, okay. through the uh, and then through the. Uh, service then you can print it or save it as a pdf whatever works best for you yeah yep okay. do that. um and um the being proactive i just want to come back to that because it was interesting how you said you know you get a dentist later in life spine stiff kyphotic you're having all these issues mm -hmm. and the thing is is when i watch and i train younger doctors often in what i'm doing with my residency teaching and just in the coaching and teaching i do and I'll see them clinically and they get, a, they can get away with it because they're young. Yeah. Like you said about age, you know, it, they, it, to them, it's like, they're pliable. They're young. They're in their twenties and they're at the latest young thirties, but they're usually in their twenties and they, they kind of can just contort their bodies. And it's funny now that I'm almost 50 here. I, I watched the residents when I was work and I actually said something to them about it. Just re and knowing this episode was coming up with you and be this being on my mind and kind of being maybe just more hyper aware of looking at them. I'm looking at some of the positions they're in. And I actually said to them in the lecture I gave, uh, I said, you know, I'm going to start to try to incorporate some more of this and help you guys with better posture because part of my job as a teacher is to help you succeed out there. And if you are craning your neck like this and bending over sure. at the waist like this and sitting in a chair that's like way too high and, you know, causing issues with, um, the, um, innervation in the legs. I mean, and vasculature in the legs. I mean, I said, yeah, I'm not doing my job. You're going to, you're going yeah. to break down. Like you're just going to break down. So it is interesting that proactive nature. And I, I find like with so many things and I'm probably telling you your job, uh, and I don't mean yeah. to be doing that, but if that's people right. only could do it proactively, I mean, how many of them, not the surgical side, obviously, and all that, but sure. the rehab, but for so many of the aches and pains and breakdown, I mean, seems like if people just could do it right properly before it became a problem, <laughs> taking myself, yeah. right? If I was doing those stretches and I was and, and was doing all the things you taught me to do, I wouldn't have needed to even see you. I wouldn't have had the extent of the problem that I did. So it, it's just such a, it's so hard. I guess what I'm trying to say is it's so hard to conceptualize the fact that we have to start doing something proactively when it's not actually hurting us or harming us. Okay. I, I think it's, it's human nature, right? I mean, yeah. to like kick, kick the can down the road, like, Oh, I don't have to worry about uh, this maintenance on the house this maintenance on the car. Is that a problem right now? Uh, until there's a problem, it's usually, you know, a huge issue. And the same thing can happen, you know, musculoskeletally yeah. um, or, or even systemically, you know, yeah. um, you know, people that don't take, you know, their diet, their exercise or health. I mean, diabetes is through the roof, right? Cholesterol is through the roof with, with people. And, you know, that's the other thing too. Like if I'm treating a, a uh, 
a dentist, for example, or a hygienist that also happens to be you know, a little bit overweight, maybe pre or in, in the throes of diabetes, mm-hmm. you know, his or her response to tissue loading is going to be in recovery is going to be a lot different than a 32 year old athlete um, because that tissue is getting wor- weaker. It's getting more brittle. Um, they might have chronic inflammation. So you have to take the kind of medical history into account too. Fortunately, most people in, in you know our professions um, tend to be healthier, mm-hmm. um, not a lot of smokers, things like that. That, but there are outliers, mm-hmm. right? Um, so the proactive approach is, is, is hard. It, it's it's not a great business model mm-hmm. if you're preventing people from needing your services. But um, at the same time, if you can minimize the number of musculoskeletal issues or at least make it to where their recovery is a little bit quicker because they, they have a better understanding of what they need to do mm-hmm. um, after. That's the other thing too. Like a lot of times... People don't quite know how they got in this position, but once we solve the problem, teach them what the fix is, they they need to know how to continue to maintain that. You have to give them the tools to maintain it. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't like patients to come back to me with the same problem. I feel like mm-hmm. I've failed them if they come back over and over again with the same problem. I didn't, mm-hmm. I missed something, right? Mm-hmm. If they come back with a different injury, you know, sprained ankle one time, you know, hip fracture and other things like that, that's a different story. But I want my patients to leave and basically say, I hope I never see you again because I know how to take care of this if it happens again. And that's a big component of McKenzie getting back to that is the um, restoration of function and the maintenance of that, the Mm. patient independence from PT. Um, Sometimes, and we kind of hinted about this earlier about like sometimes with PTs and chiros, this is, this is very general. So I'm not, I don't want to bash chiros at all, but I have a lot of patients that will go to chiros indefinitely for prolonged periods of time for, for maintenance, even if they're not having symptoms. Mm -hmm. And I don't understand that mindset because I don't, I don't know what maintenance has to happen if that they need the chiropractor for that. Mm -hmm. Whereas maintenance for my patients are just keep doing your exercises that got you better. Yeah. You know, keep doing that and you should be okay. If it doesn't work, come back, but you don't need to see me to review stuff with you. Um, and just tell you that you're doing okay. You'll know, you know, if you're doing okay or not. Um, so that 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 kind of that last part of the recovery, uh, the the maintenance and independence from the clinician is very scary for some patients, but it's necessary for their their success. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I still I'm do sure the we- stretches you taught me. I still do. I mean, literally every yeah. single day, um, and that's how I've even at times, you know, just to, I'm on the computer a lot now. And so I'm still in that, <laughs> that flex position and still push my body very hard physically outside of, of work. So, um, I still can't, you know, every now and again, I'll flare up a little bit and I just you know, keep really diligent on those stretches. And I always can get it to settle back down, uh, using what you told me again. And I don't even have to sure. go to you. I do early on. I mean, I think I remember once or twice I would come back for something and, and I remember that you would be like, we must, there must've been something we missed because you shouldn't be, have been good for a year. And now all of a sudden you're coming to see, and sure enough, it was, I wasn't stretching enough. I wasn't doing this, right. It started doing something a little differently. Uh, so to you, to validate what you're saying as a patient, it, yeah, it wasn't like, I guess people could maybe think from the intro or what I was saying that I was constantly seeing you over this time. No, yeah. I mean, oh, I would no. probably say, you know, if I, if I saw you for more than like five visits at a, in a, in succession during a yeah. time that I had something bothering me, you were like, whoa, whoa, whoa what? Okay, something's going on here. Yeah. I, don't know, I don't think I ever did. I mean, it was almost always it, it was it was it would be one arm, then it'd be the other arm, then it'd be one wrist, the other wrist. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> there are some patients that do need a, a tune up here or there because they do kind of get off. Usually, if, if patients come back, the the one thing that they almost constantly will say is that, like, yeah, I I stopped doing my exercises, yep. and so there are some patients that they never can, they can't ever stop. Their problem might not get go away a hundred percent, but they will be good 99% of the time. Um, it's, it's again, like the patient has diabetes or high cholesterol that you always have that, but if you're taking your medication, you manage it, mm-hmm. go off your medication, your symptoms go nuts. Mm-hmm. So usually when people struggle, it's, they stopped too soon. And I don't always know what that number is. Like how mm-hmm. many months after PT can you stop doing these regularly? Most patients experience neck pain, back pain, or other musculoskeletal problems that it, it, it severely inhibits their lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Once they find what helps them, they don't stop. Yeah, because they they yep. have you know kind of that PTSD almost of what it was like beforehand. They don't want to go back to that. Yeah. Um, so once you once the patient sees how beneficial the exercises are or the treatment approach, they they tend to stick with it. Mm-hmm. Um, some patients don't want to move, and if a patient doesn't want to move, it's really hard to get them better. Mm-hmm. Um, 
because there's very few things that I can do that don't involve some movement. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's sometimes a challenge is convincing patients this, this movement or this experience of pain, like you're describing mm -hmm. can be beneficial if it behaves a very certain way, Yeah, you know, and that's, that's where the education part comes in. You know, patients have to trust you, you know, you have your hands on them or your, you know, your guys case, you have their, their, your hands in their mouths and they're dependent upon you to kind of understand their problem, like hear them mm -hmm. and then give them some solutions. Um, and the, you know, that, that trust is, that trust is vital in that relationship. Yeah. And the behavior of pain, that's a huge one that you've said to me so many times, you, you would always in the beginning spend time with me before you did anything, just trying to find out how is your pain behaving? When is it worse? You would always, ask, does it get worse when you work out or better? Is, you know, mm -hmm. and it, if you work into the pain, can it, can you get it to go away? And that was big. And, and the other thing I think that's important I don't think a lot of people know, and you bring a good, of a good point, and we're you know, talking kind of before we, we started recording the show about whether or not chiropractic or PT or, or even going to the orthopedic surgeon, how do, if there's a, a, a dental professional out there listening yeah. and they're suffering from some of this back, neck, wrist, elbow, whatever, right? Any of those issues, how do they even know? Do they, can they, and maybe this is regional, maybe this is insurance based, but do they go, yeah. I, mean, I feel like if they go to the orthopedic surgeon, they're going to get one answer, maybe a cortisone shot and you know, look for more of the treatment side of things, maybe look into imaging and, and that side. And I know with, sometimes you need the imaging for what you do too, and they work hand in hand, but, but if they're yeah. just there, like, where is a, is there a general place they start or can they just go to find a good PT near them to just go to try to get some answers? Yeah, it depends. Like in New York State, we have direct access. So and I think you utilize that a couple of times. You just kind of call up and say, hey, I've been having yeah. this elbow pain yeah. for a couple of weeks. You know, um, I'd like to you know, see a PT. I'd see Kevin and uh, we, we can evaluate you. We have a very specific uh, set of time and a number of visits. We can see somebody before we'd have to say, hey, this isn't working. You got to get you to your doctor. Okay. And I'm not sure how many, how many states across the country have that. I don't know okay. specifically which ones, but that's a that's information on the um, probably on the APTA, American Physical Therapy Association website would have okay. states have direct access. Um, I think honestly, it, I think it's your personality type. You know, um, some people you know, want to go to chiropractors. They, they want to be cracked, mobilized, manipulated. And sometimes it is a quick fix. I mean, mm -hmm. there are certain mechanical things that can clear up very quickly with that type of work. And if you can tolerate that and you trust have a chiropractor, you trust, I think as long as he or she is still treating you mechanically, if it's a mechanical issue, mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't have a problem with that. I, I work with chiropractors. We refer back and forth and I, I use ones that have a, I shouldn't say use, I will refer to ones because it's mm -hmm. a collaborative effort. Um, that have a similar mindset of let's treat the mechanical origin of this problem and not mm -hmm. get bogged down in esoterics or um, you got to buy inserts or orthotics. I mean, that's sometimes down the road that stuff might be helpful, but let's, let's get at the real problem. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and go into a, go into surgeons, your surgeons are fantastic at doing surgery and that's their wheelhouse, but they have limited tools outside of, you know, they might have a needle for an injection or, or a, a prescription for a pill or a surgery. And if you don't want any of that stuff or that might not be appropriate, PT is the least of all the um, uh, approaches as far as invasiveness, because mm -hmm. we don't do anything invasive. Mm -hmm. And if someone was to come to me with a complaint of, let's say, elbow pain or a dental hygienist or a dentist, my first goal is to establish, is this a mechanical issue? Mm -hmm. is, it, is it an elbow problem or is it coming from their neck? Mm -hmm. And all that comes from the history, the questions we ask them. And then the answers we get it's like an algorithm. It drives our next question. And yeah. our, then once we have all the history, we say, okay, this to me sounds like it actually might be a problem in your neck. And here's why, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Let's examine your neck first, if you don't mind. And if that doesn't change anything, we're going to look at your elbow as well. Um, but it has to start with the history. So you have to have the, I think if you have a personality where you want to learn how to fix it yourself, mm. PT is great. Um, I, I think it, it's, it, it's less invasive. Um, less risk of, I think some injury, because sometimes again, with chiropractic manipulations, there is a higher risk of injury in certain mm -hmm. parts, especially the neck. Mm -hmm. You know, that's if they're usually run into troubles, it's usually with the neck. Um, I don't do any manipulation. If somebody needs it, I'll refer them out. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't, I never learned that skill and I don't feel like I need it. Um, mm -hmm. majority of my patients don't need that much force on their spines. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I, you know, again, I think patients, if they are, are looking for, uh, not a relief, but a fix. You have to be comfortable with the person providing that basically. So if you, if, if you have been to a chiropractor, go back to that chiropractor, you've been mm -hmm. to PT, go to that PT. If you don't know one or the other, I'm biased. I'm actually going to say, 
try to find a physical therapist, especially one that specializes in McKenzie care, because that's a, a whole system of evaluation and treatment that's been proven to be effective. And our whole goal is patient independence of the clinician providing the care, mm-hmm. you know, get you better. And then you're on your own from there if, if you can manage it, basically. Yeah. Well, it works. And, um, and I appreciate you. I know it's not easy to talk about the interdisciplinary aspects of this. And, uh, and so thank you for laying out just the differences that people can expect. And I like that you said, you know, some people are going to want one over the other and it kind of is personality dependent too. And yeah, sure. Saying? I think there, it's like any profession. Like I, again, I do refer to some chiropractors, some chiropractors refer to us. Um, there are, are, you know, plenty of PTs in our area that do different approaches that are just as effective. So, um, you know, if you've, if you've found somebody that's worked for you or you hear good things, it's, it's worth pursuing. Mm-hmm. Um, you just want to make sure whoever you're working with is attentive to what you're telling them and has an active interest in your recovery mm-hmm. and not just trying to fit you into a, a box of this is how I'm going to treat you because this is how I treat everybody. Yes. Right. Yes. Individualized care. I think yes. is the best way to look at that. Yes. And that's how I, that's what I preach in, in my teaching on the orthodontic side of things is individualized care. You can have systems, you have protocols, sure. just like you said, you have a process you go through, you, you know, you have, you have a diagnostic process. It's not like you need to sit there and, and, and reinvent the wheel on every patient. That being said, you, you have to go through those steps on every patient, no matter what you have to go through those. And in my profession too often we get, and I'm sure it happens in yours too. A lot of people get very busy and it's easy to just kind of want to just kind of start the fix of things and just start getting to the fix without really taking the time to do the di- appropriate diagnostic procedures. And next thing you know, and as, and as you said, in certain centers, you might hit it right. You know, you might, yeah. it works in most cases, you may guess right. And, and in those cases, fine. The ones that cause you the biggest challenge, at least in what I do, is the ones you'd, when people do it that way and they don't guess right, uh, a lot of things happen that are that are quite negative down the road. And a lot of that sure. could have been prevented by what you said, which is that, and I think this translates through all medical professions, uh, is getting at the true cause. And, and all of us have probably sadly had an experience where we've been to a physician or dentist or, or therapist and, and realized that they're treating, you know, we're a little ways in and we realized they never really took the time to figure out what is actually going on. Yeah. And now we're down a path that we don't even want to be down. And if they had just taken the time to kind of figure things out back in the beginning, we, we wouldn't be down that path. Well, as a, as a physical therapist, you know, especially switching to, you know, McKenzie, it, it took me some time to get comfortable telling patients that, you know, you're, you're going to feel some discomfort as we do some of these things. And, and this is what it means and why. Mm. And it's okay to have some discomfort if it behaves a certain way. Like you had yeah. said, like getting that end range can be very uncomfortable, mm. but does it make you worse? No, I'm not worse. It just hurts to do it. Okay. Then we're safe. Let's keep, keep going yeah. and selling patients who are in, in acute pain. And trust me, I've, uh, I just last year got over a really bad case of a bulging disc in my back and sciatica. And, and ironically enough, none of my treatment techniques were really helping me. Mm. I ended up needing an injection. And then that slowly got helped me get better to where I could do my physical therapy and get improvement mm-hmm, and get mm-hmm. recovery. But I needed, I needed that more invasive intervention because mm-hmm. the conservative stuff didn't get me better. Mm-hmm. So, you know, convincing patients that you may feel some discomfort as we go along, but if it behaves a certain way, it's safe. Getting them to trust you and explain to them that, wait a minute, you're, you're telling me, Kevin, you're telling me I'm going to have some pain. I don't want pain. I'm here to get rid of pain. Mm-hmm. I, I get it, but this is how it's going to behave if we're doing the right thing. Yeah. And then it's less scary for the patient. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and again, probably in your discipline, same type of thing. Like, you know, you, you start using braces and adjusting, you know, Invisalign, things like that. I mean, my wife's going through that. Your teeth hurt mm-hmm. initially. Yeah. yeah. You know, there's, a, there's an, a, an adjustment that's necessary, but yeah. if the patient knows ahead of time, this is normal. They're a little less scared. I think. I'm so glad you said that part. I hadn't thought to say that. That was really big with me, with with what you would help me with, because I, I, I don't know, a lot of people are listening. Uh, if anyone knows me listening, they, they don't need me to say this, if those who don't know me personally, but I tend to push the limits a little bit. Yeah, we had things. some conversations about like moderation, <laughs> right? I, I think we talked about that a time or two, but um, yeah. so I said to you, like, you've got to tell me where I need to stop because I will go, I'll push, I'll push through the pain. I, 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 I need to know what's okay pain and what's not. And you were really yeah. helpful for that. That, and I get that, that I'm so glad you brought that up because that 
you said it helps patients to know whether the, the pain they're experiencing is, is okay or not. That was really big. A lot of times just peace of mind. You know, I, and sure. Renee would say to me sometimes if something would, when you know, something would flare up, be an issue. She's like, do you need to go to see Kevin to see like, if this is pain you should be working through, you know, cause again, I'll just deal with the pain. I'll, I'll just suck it up and keep pushing harder. But I, I would always say to you, like, if you tell me, like, I can't go to this point, I will listen. You know, I yeah. trust you and yeah. I won't go past that. But if you tell me that that's an okay pain and if I work into that, I'll get better and I'm going to help myself, then I'm going to, I'm going to deal with pain. And, and so, yeah. um, that was really, that was really helpful to know what, what is good pain and what is bad pain. And that's helped me again, because I continue to push my body very hard physically. That helps me. I mean, I don't think there's a week that goes by that I don't have to, you know, manage that sort of like, is this normal good or am I pushing sure. too hard? It's, it's good to know yeah. that. Yeah. That's a really great yeah. point. Um, and, and again, that you teach your patients that, and I think we can learn that as you said, applying to the orthodontic and, and even any dental profession, the more we prepare our patients for the pain that they're going to likely experience the better job we're doing as a provider really is to just well, hey look this is normal and especially if it behaves in the way that you told the patient it should behave right, then right. they 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 kind of like okay now i trust this 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 person and they they must know what they're talking about because it it did what it said it, it would do and with mckenzie one of the hallmarks that we look for is this concept called centralization where peripheral symptoms that are either coming from a cervical reticulopathy or lumbar reticulopathy which i've treated hygienists and dentists with both of those um the pain maybe is referring to their elbow or forearm and as they get better through repeated motions and certain exercises and treatment the pain starts to recede out of their elbow into their bicep or out of their bicep into their shoulder out of their shoulder into their neck and now they have you know, centrally located neck pain and they no mm. longer have peripheral pain. Mm. If if you don't explain that concept to a patient and they come back after a couple of visits and say, okay, now Kevin, I have this neck pain I never had before. I came in with elbow pain. Why does my neck hurt? Are you, what did you do to me? Mm. It's harder to explain to them on day six that it's normal versus, hey, on day one, if this works, you're going to start to feel the pain, leave your arm and go into your neck if that's where it's coming from. Uh. And don't freak out because your neck's going to be sore for a couple of days. But if it stays there, We've got this thing on the ropes. We're almost we're almost going to beat this thing down if we can get it to the neck. If it's a you know cervical radiculopathy. So that's so why you always ask me my, about my neck because you would always correct. ask me. When we were working on my extremities if, at night. Fall visits. You're like How, anything in your neck. You know, you'd always kind of just feel my neck, and I was like, no, next fine. Well, because what we've learned through not not me personally, but the researchers that did a pretty big uh, prospective study a, a while back looking at extremity related pain um, or pain in the extremity of like 700 some odd different individuals, depending on the body part, you know, a third of the time, the pain was coming from a little over a third of the time. If it was the, uh, the shoulder, it was coming from the neck about 35% of the time. I think the elbow may have been a little less than a third of the time, but that's a, you know, a, a large percentage of your population that you're treating that might not get better if you don't look at the, the spine, mm -hmm. or if you explain to the patient, if you start getting neck pain because of this and you're getting less arm pain, we're good. And then mm -hmm. they, again, they, th they know what you're talking. They believe you know what you're talking about. They trust you. And now they're excited. It's like, Hey, they'll come in, Kevin, guess what? No more pain in my elbow. I just feel it in my shoulder blade. Like you mm -hmm. said, it would happen. So we're getting better, right? Yes. Good. They're, they're engaged, right? Mm -hmm. they, they bought in if you want to use a salesman type approach, but you have to have that engagement. And that's where the education on day one is. So there shouldn't be any surprises. Right. That's yeah. why I, I counsel my patients. You know, if you experience this, it's good. If you experience this, it's bad. Stop. Yeah. It's not a no pain, no gain. It's not a suck it up and deal. Right. You, know, you were probably the outlier to the other extreme of we got to dial you in, Mike, where most <laughs> patients are like, you got to push a little bit harder, Mabel. Come on. <laughs> yeah. You know, we got to work you a little bit harder. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I tend to go the other way, but um, no, that's, that, that's great advice. Uh, well, thank you for, for laying that out. And, and I want to spend a little bit of time too going over what you do that's really in our in our arena which is kind of the TMD side of things um i um we've worked together with patients uh it, when i was practicing up there and uh really enjoyed working with you because of your approach and you helped patients of mine um we had one in particular case that was really challenging and and yeah. she was uh, late teen, mid to late teen female, really, really going yes. through a lot of life stuff. As you said, there's sometimes life factors yeah. and, and really, yeah. uh, and, and we haven't even, I mean, we haven't spoken about this case in, I don't know, was it probably six, seven years, but we bo yeah. both remember it. And, um, and we worked together very easily, very seamlessly. I mean, it was really quite easy and you really did help her a lot. And, and just to give a little sort of background to this in, in our profession, we have certain guidelines that we try to say, okay, is this, 
pathology is this, you know, what is causing again, getting at doing your diagnostics, right? Temperament sure. disorders, a lot of it, just like what you were saying, it comes down to diagnostics. I never find some people find it really, really confusing um, because it is multifactorial, but that to me just said, I just have to get at what's happening here. Is this a parafunctional habit? Is this a functional issue? Uh, like I said, as a, as a pathology, is it something that we need the oral surgeon? And so in this particular case, I was quite confident it was, it was muscular. It was musculoskeletal. I was quite confident. And so I said, she to go see physical therapist. And she had tried from some different dentists and orthodontists and guards and splints. And she was breaking through things. And I said, I mean, her musculature was so tight. Yeah. So I, said, I think she was you so got to see yeah. a PT. So talk me yeah. through when you get a patient, like, I guess I'd say two questions, two parts of the question. Yeah. One is what are the things that the PT can help with in TMD? And how do you go through figuring out if you're going to be able, if you, you know, how would a dentist go figuring out if they should send the patient to the PT? Sure. That's a good question. I mean, I, you know, full, like we talked about kind of the, before the intro, you know, full disclosure, I, I don't have any specific specialization in TMD. I, I, there's, I think a tech, technique, I think it's Roccobato is the technique. A lot of therapists will get certified in that to treat TMD. Um, but I still, uh, I do get on occasion and um, I, I still treat the same way I treat any other uh a peripheral joint you know it's a joint it's a mechanical entity that has the the disc in there and it's prone to mechanical problems due to overuse poor posture of repetitive stress i believe the patient we're talking about didn't she play like the flute or clarinet or something yes, she, yep yep you know Good memory. so yeah. you know a lot of time spent practicing and so she it, probably a majority of the tmd patients that i get in my opinion don't have the classic mechanical clunking, clicking mm -hmm. pain with, um, you know, chewing or things like that. They, they either have, um, uh, you know, headaches, facial pain, mm -hmm. um, some limited mobility. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've found a majority of those, uh, they're driven from the neck, either literally referred pain from the neck mm -hmm. or, um, postural stress due to forward head posture. And then that jaw kind of protrudes forward. Mm -hmm. Um, some of them, you know, probably do have some uh, structural anomalies, you know, that might be contributing to it. That's where I, I, you know, I trust you guys to kind of rule that stuff out. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think if, you know, if a dentist has a patient that's complaining of, you know, atypical TMJ, uh, the TMD type pain, you know, it, um, it jumps from side to side. They have headaches. Um, they don't really get the clicking or the crunching, but they feel like it's uh, they, their, their facial muscles get tired or fatigued with a lot of chewing or mm. talking. Mm -hmm. um, I have a patient right now who's a, um, a professor and he came in with uh, basically kind of uh, facial pain, his diagnosis, mm. you know, TMD, I think was on the script, but his complaint is mostly when he talks a lot, his face and head gets really painful. And it started after, ironically enough, going uh, to the dentist and having cleaning. Mm. And um, he, he, I don't know if he felt the, the cleaning was very aggressive or not, but he he had some problems after that. Now he can fully open and close his mouth. He can, you know, medial lateral deviate, um, but he gets pain. And I really think it's an upper cervical spine issue because mm. it it's right-sided, it's left-sided, it's it rolls into the occipital. Um, uh, behind the eye to the orbital area, uh, up into the parietal area, it, it's, it fluctuates. Whereas the TMJ patients I've treated that truly have that dysfunction, they're just pointing. It hurts right here. Yep, yep. It clicks, it yep. pops, it gets yep. stuck. Yep. I personally see less of that. I don't know if it's because those patients go to other PTs that spend a lot of time treating this, which that's great if they do, because I think it's a fantastic skill to have, or maybe dentists, don't know to refer out in some cases. Yeah, you know, I think a lot of times the ones you're describing, you're right. You you basically we make a night guard or a splint um, just to try to disocclude, disarticulate, get them out of having a parafunctional habit. Because a lot of times, if there's no again pathology and your imaging reveals that the joint is normal uh, and, and there's no issue with the disc or the glenoid fossa, then you tend to yeah. just say, okay, well let's try to get you so you're not clenching, grinding, bruxing, et cetera, uh, and figure out why that's happening. And they'll make a splint. And a lot of those patients, when you, what we call deprogram, when you deprogram them and decompensate the, the, um, aberrant function and, and sort of the uh, etiology of it, then they will, a lot of times it'll settle down and they'll calm down. And then you can go in and do what you need to do to address the bite, address the teeth, et cetera. Yeah. So I would guess a lot of those patients, most dentists are pretty comfortable. And if they're not, they know a colleague who they would refer to, who is, sure. is well-versed in, in that. And then, but the ones like the patient I was referring that I was talking about referred to you, it was 
to the point that I mean, she couldn't chew. She, she I mean, and, and I looked, yeah. the joint was no, there was no clicking, no popping, and it, it, but yet she just had this limited range of motion, and she, yeah. her masseters were so tight, her pterygoids were so tight. I'm like, I mean, her her temporalis muscles, everything was just like in a yeah. knot, and I just got this feeling. I said, I, I mean, I don't feel that this is anything that really any splint guard she'd already tried a bunch of them with some other people is going to is going to do i think yeah. you need to see some you need some physical therapy to to figure out why you are so tight yeah yeah and she i mean we we worked a lot on you know cervical spine um you know retraction which kind of opens up the upper cervical spine um and getting to end range just like you're talking about with your elbows like we right. don't we especially people that are either playing a musical instrument or on the computer or your hygienist and dentist they're bent over clients you're almost at end range protrusion which creates um, upper cervical extension, lower cervical flexion, and that can create some, uh, some occipital problems, headaches, jaw pain, face pain. Um, and, and retraction is the opposite of that. It kind of pulls you in the opposite direction to open up that area and realign your spine. So we did a lot of that with her. Um, I, I did a lot of manual stuff with her. I mean, I put gloves on, get my fingers right inside of her mouth and massage those muscles, mm. get in there. And she was tender and sore. Oh and yeah. I'd I say, remember palpating you know, her my initial. She yeah. was tender to the touch, yeah. not even pressure. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's the type of thing. Like that's where you say, okay, we're going to, we're going to expose this tissue to some stress that you can tolerate. It's going to be painful, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but if we continue to expose it to a, a low level enough that is stimulating your symptom, but not aggravating your symptom, it will become desensitized, mm -hmm. but it will take weeks. Mm -hmm. And I think she did pretty well. I think she came back for a second round later on was doing better. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, she was going through some life changes as well. Yes. And there's probably some yes. psychosocial stuff going on there with, with her, um, yeah. especially that age. Um, and so you, you can understand like there's probably more to it than just the physical component of it, but she was a good patient. She was compliant. She stretched like I asked her to, she, I had her work on upper, upper back strengthening, postural muscle strengthening, yep. um, just to correct that rounded shoulder forward head posture. Yeah. Well, that was a fun case because I ended up then once yeah. she got with you and we can, we collaborated and figured out you were confident you were going to be able to loosen her up. And I went in and did Invisalign with her. She had some premature contacts on her back teeth from kind of a, one of the guards she had wasn't covering was before her 12 year old molars erupted. Cause she'd been battling this for years and, and they, then they erupted. So she was hitting prematurely on those. So I did some Invisalign to intrude those and got her bite to close. Cause she was touching only on those back molars. When she started, she was literally only hitting on her 12 year old molars. And, and so mm -hmm. I, and the case treated out beautifully and it was so fun to watch her come out of pain because you sure. literally could just see her transform. Um, I mean, every time she'd come in, how's the jaw? How are you feeling? No, good. I mean, it went to the point that she was like almost in tears at every visit because she was in so much pain to like, no, this is good to the point at that at the end, it was like, I, she was like totally unaware that there was any issue, which, yeah. which was really yeah. fun. It was really fun to see what yeah. the collaboration Those are rewarding can. because of, you know, how it affects her, her lifestyle so much. And, and, you know, that, and, uh, and maybe some of your, your listeners or, or uh, people in your profession, you know, get headaches, headaches are another thing we treat a lot of that are cervical generated for the same exact problem, upper cervical, uh, re, you know, mobile, uh, mobility issues or uh, entrapment and, you know, getting headaches, getting face pain because of, of that area and headaches can be debilitating for people. And if you, mm -hmm. uh, if you help me with headaches, I remember I had a, a patient years ago, I'll never forget the guy. He was a large guy. He was Irish, like right, right from Ireland. He was a contractor. He was a, you know, a man's man. Right. Mm -hmm. And he'd had headaches for years and had Botox and chiropractic sorts of treatments you know, five visits doing the mechanical assessment, the treatment I gave him, the exercises, abolished his headaches, abolished them. Wow. And he came in for his last visit and he was angry, angry. And I'm like, what, what is going on? You're feeling better. He's like, I've been suffering for 10 years mm. and all it took were your silly little exercises. And that mm. made me better. Why mm. didn't anybody else direct me here? Mm. So I think, you know, to your colleagues, if I give any advice to P, I'm not soliciting business for myself, just in general or PT. If you have a patient that has something that you're not quite sure, it could be musculoskeletal, they're frustrated by it. It's it's facial pain. It's not of an origin that you're typically experienced with. There's no harm in referring out to a PT that has experience treating mechanical problems. Because the mm -hmm. worst case scenario is they say, we can't figure out what it is. But at least you're telling your patients, hey, well, let's here's an opportunity for a solution, right? Because maybe yeah. it is musculoskeletal. You know, the, the the head and face and jaw, it's, it's like any other part of the body in some regards as far as soft tissue and, and mm -hmm. joints have to move mm -hmm. and they can get irritated for any number of reasons. So um, again, I think that'd be the case where if you just have patients that have atypical facial neck head pain, a referral out, if it doesn't seem like it's something more sinister, can't hurt. 
That's such a good point. And, you know, we don't learn that. We don't learn that. We're not taught to coordinate. I mean, so much of my journey now is trying to not only help on the diagnostic thing and be more proactive and, 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 and get colleagues to think differently about this stuff, but I learn constantly with it too. And just in hindsight, if it weren't for my interactions with you, and I mean, I just reached out to you before I referred the patient, say, Hey, Kev, this is what's going on. Got this patient. You think, you know, you could see, you know, yeah, let me see her. Sounds like maybe I mean, if I can't help her, I'll let you know, but let me see her. And so yeah. I don't think I would have been I don't think it would have crossed my mind, truthfully, to, to go the PT route necessarily with her. I don't think it crosses a lot of my colleagues' minds because we're not learning that. But I hope people sure. listen to that and now realize, wait a minute, it may be me, as in the doctor, hygienist, assistant, or, or whatever, whoever's listening to the show. It also, for those in the healthcare field, could be your patient that is going through yeah. something. And the headaches are a great point. I mean, so many people that I know suffer from headaches. And... um if you actually, if you don't mind me asking a little more about that, do you yeah. tend to see people in the dental profession that suffer from them more commonly than others? Um, I, no, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, my experience with, with people in the dental profession is usually, you know, neck or upper extremity, shoulder, elbow. Okay. Um, I don't see a lot of risk partly because I don't treat, we have a certified hand therapist that operates her practice out of our location. Mm -hmm. yep. So she gets all like the wrist and hand stuff. So I can't speak to that. Um, but I, I think as a PT, I've gotten better because I wouldn't ask. Like some people won't offer they have headaches. I think it's just I wake up with a headache because I'm stressed okay. out. Yeah. So then you start, you have to ask more. Like yeah. you have this neck pain. Do you ever get headaches? Yeah, I get a headache every morning. But that's, you know, whatever. I didn't sleep well because my husband snored, whatever the case may be, right? Right, right. And then you start really examining that and you find out, oh, this is driven from your neck. This mm. this elbow pain is driven from your, your, your neck. It's kind of all related. So I can't speak to and say like it's it's more prevalent in in your profession than others but it's not uncommon in people that have neck history you just have to ask that question mm -hmm. um and I, and I you know to your point of like you know oh orthodontists we don't know to refer out well i think pts could do a better job of marketing themselves at times too mm, fair. you know I, I i was fortunate to kind of meet you you know when i when i did and um you know so then we've become a resource for each other but i i haven't actively gone out to dental groups mm -hmm. um par partly because it's hard to get out and, and market but also um you know the the volume of patients that we see i don't consider myself a specialist in tmd patients mm -hmm. so i don't want to market myself as an sure. expert sure you yeah. know yeah but, but facial pain or head pain of mechanical origin might be a better term but uh, you know, dentists are looking for people that probably like really, they do the TMJ treatments, right? Right. Like they're familiar with. You were willing to say, hey, "Let's try this, Kevin. What do you think?" Yep. And that collaboration is very helpful. Yep. Yeah. And, and again, back to the mind, what we can do for my colleagues is take the time to diagnose and look at your patient. And and yeah. uh, you know, again, instead of just sending her to the oral surgeon or telling her I couldn't help her, I I'm working it up. And I'm not saying this is like a pat on my back. I'm just saying it, it, it wasn't that hard to figure out for me that there was something yeah. <laughs> musculoskeletal going on when I started to put my fingers in her mouth. I mean, sadly, a lot of orthodontists out there will do a clinical initial exam and they, they will literally like just take a mirror and just kind of look in the patient's mouth or look at some pictures. And, and I'm big on saying, and I, I, I say this all the time. I don't say this to make disparaging remarks about my colleagues. I say this because we're so much better than that. And sure. we, we miss that opportunity and, and we need to take the time to go through the process that you go through, that we hope our physicians go through and that we want any of our medical or healthcare providers to go through, which is so absent today in healthcare. You know, they, everyone wants to jump yeah. right to the solution, the pill, the, the, this, the, that, you know, that will solve your problem uh, and not take that time. And I think that's, a, that case is a really beautiful example of the two of us working together to think outside of our own necessarily comfort zone in the sense that it's not like we're doing this all the time. We're familiar with yeah, it, yeah. but we were like, Hey, let's, we, we can figure that let's put our minds together. And if we can't, then we'll, we'll take, take the next step. But it's a minimally not actually not case non-invasive approach, as you alluded to earlier in the show, let's see how she does. And in this particular girl's case, I mean, it completely changed her life. Like this girl's, yeah. I mean, she, when she first came to my office, mom and her were in my my consult room it broken down in tears, like because of her yeah. chronic pain. I mean, this girl, she, she was missing school. At that point, I want to say she was maybe 15, maybe 16. She wasn't going to school. Roughly, I mean, it, was, yeah. Yeah. it was brutal on this, on this girl. And so sure. yeah, I just encourage my colleagues, anyone listening, take the time to just kind of get to the bottom of this and, and think about, about the, the PT side uh, in it. 
Yeah, I think, you know, as I've, you know, 30 years of doing this, I, I've learned a couple of things that have helped me. You know, one is um, it, it's OK to say I don't know mm. because I don't know everything. I, I'd yeah. be I'd be Same. foolish to think that I did and very yep. arrogant to think that I did. Yep. But then my follow up to that is, but let's see if we can find out what it is. Right. Yep. If I can't help you, let's find out who can. And I think. None of us want to fail. None of us want to fail helping. Somebody comes to their office, they're asking you for help. If you are worth your weight, so to speak, you have it in you. Like, I, I want to help this page. I'm not yes. just doing this to make a buck. I want to help this person. They've come to me. You know, I, yeah. I, they're trusting me. So yeah. you don't want to fail. Yeah. But sometimes, no matter what you do, it doesn't work. Or you find out, you know what? your particular problem is not a fit for what I do. Mm. That's not a failure. That's actually good because now you're going to steer the, you know, bring the patient to the next individual who might be able to help them. Yeah. And it happens. They, they kind of get passed through the system. Um, but it, it, like you said, trying to figure out, just listening to the patient and asking them, Hey, you know, you're this jaw pain. Do you get any headaches? Does your neck hurt? Mm. Yeah, it does. You know, and mm. when my neck hurts, my jaw feels worse. Huh? Interesting. Mm. Okay. So maybe that's a patient that, you send out the PT first, like you did, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then it be, you know it becomes collaborative, uh, you know that way. Yeah. Um, so it's what's in the best interest of the patient. Yeah, is what it comes down to. And yeah. if it, you know, if I have a patient that I can't help them, but I think a chiropractor that I know can, that's what's best for the patient. Send them yeah. there. Yep. Right. Or vice versa. You know. And yeah. most people will appreciate that. I completely agree with that. Most people appreciate the honesty. There were plenty of things that, again, talking about the TMD thing, there were certain things I did, but once it got outside of my comfort zone and wasn't what I, was my wheelhouse, I had a couple of people in the community that I'd say, you know what, I'm going to have you so go see this person because this is what they're doing every day and they're better at it than me and I trust their judgment and I want you to go see them because what I do in the, the initial diagnostic steps that I'm taking are saying to me that that's something more than what I'm going to be able to help you with, with my skill set and, and, um, and knowledge base are going to do. And I, I think all too many times as providers in any capacity, we're hesitant to do that. Like you said, we almost feel like one, it's a failure. Like we're admitting, like, yeah. I don't know, a patient's gonna think, I don't know what I'm talking about. And the patient knows, you know, what you're talking about, you have the degrees on the wall and you have the credibility. They came to your office for a reason. They know sure. you have a reputation. They know you're, 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 you're capable. I completely agree with you. They appreciate the honesty. Uh, they do. They appreciate someone that's trying to find the answer for them more than just saying, oh, let's try this or let's try that. <laughs> Happen. Sure. Without having, yeah. I mean, they, you know, they, they don't. I mean, you don't want to disappoint your patients, but I think you don't want to. You don't want to take on more than you can handle because then you look even more foolish. Yeah. And uh, you know, I think if if anything, with like young clinicians coming out, whether it's PT or, or orthodontics, you know, uh, don't try to master it all and do everything all at once because you will learn nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I take it. I look at it like a. You know, you go to a diner and the menu is about three inches thick. Right. And there's no way they can make all of those dishes really well. Right. <laughs> right, right. So a lot of good, a lot of good restaurants have very limited options because that's yes. what they do really well. Yeah. So yeah. as I get older, I started to kind of funnel down to, I, I treat musculoskeletal injuries very well. Now that's a whole host of other issues that go along with that, but I, I don't delve into pelvic floor therapy, wound mm. care, mm. Um, even some like sport training I've backed away from because I don't have the time or the space to be that consistent with it where I'm benefiting the patient, where I benefit the patient most is helping them recover from their surgery, injury, pain, restore function, get them independent, and then teach them how to manage their care. And we're busy just doing that. Like yeah. If you look at our list of services on our, on our website, we don't have three dozen services yeah. because we can't be good at all that. There's just yeah. no way. Yeah. So master what you're good at, and then you'll be you'll have plenty of clients because they'll know that you're good at what you do. That's such good advice. So many times in my profession, I they, Pete, there's so many docs, young and old, that are trying to treat every patient from you can debate the age to start. There's a whole big debate in my profession of when you start these patients, and some saying three, four, some saying that's complete malpractice. And again, it's it, it, but yeah. I think a lot of it is not everybody's comfortable treating younger kids, and I've said that very openly. Sure. And because of what you just said. Because they're like, well, I have to be able to perform every level of treatment. I have to be able to do Invisalign on a 75-year-old. And I also have to be able to handle the six-year-old or whatever age you're going to start. <clears throat> it's okay. If you feel better about it or you want to focus on one of those other the over the other, focus on yeah. that and collaborate with your colleagues. There are plenty of patients to go around. It, you know, sure. it, it's 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 do don't right. dabble. Don't be a dabbler. Yeah. I love right? it. Yep. Don't be a dabbler. Because yep. you're just be you're not gonna master anything. Nope. 
and yep. you're probably not servicing the patient. You're servicing your ego, maybe. Yep. Like yep. I don't treat pediatrics. I, you know, I, I try to avoid that, I, especially anything developmental. I don't have the background. I'm not comfortable, and I wouldn't be doing that child a service. If it was my own child, I would refer them out to right. a PT or an OT that or speech therapist that specialize in that because they don't dabble in that. They know their they know their stuff. Yeah. Uh, give me the orthopedic stuff all day long. The developmental virologic stuff. There's other PTs so much better than me out there. So I turn away business, Parkinson's, stroke, because I don't, I don't have the skill set, and it's not going to help that patient. Yeah, and it's okay. You know, you're not doing a disservice. I think you're doing the patient a favor. Such a great message. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave it with that. That is such a great. You know, it's so interesting. This conversation went in so many different directions. I didn't anticipate. Sometimes when I, when I, as a host, you, you, you you kind of get a feel for an episode and, and we know each other well. And I told yeah. you when I was talking about having you on, like, I, I just like to have a show where we talk and, and thank sure. you for being willing to just bounce around on this. Uh, I I'm so excited with how much we covered that I didn't even anticipate covering. And I love yeah. that you were open about it and really want to acknowledge you for, for what you did for me all those years, but what you're doing for your patients oh. and the message you put across that, Hey, focus on the patient, stay in your lane, don't dabble, focus on sure. your patient. And whether it's the you know, this message is received by the provider who's struggling with neck or back or wrist or elbow pain. Uh, and hopefully they think about things a little differently or the provider who's looking at their patient and thinking, you know, the hygienist or dentist who's like, geez, yeah, I've got a patient that kind of can't get to the bottom of this. Maybe I should think in, in the physical therapy realm. Uh, there's just so much yeah. that was, that was offered. And I really appreciate you taking the time. I know you're crazy busy in your practice and you got a lot going uh, on. No so problem. to come give us this time and share this is, uh, I greatly appreciate it. Well, I, I appreciate the opportunity. You know, it's my first podcast. My wife asked me if I was, if I was nervous. I'm like, I got to talk about myself and what I do for 45 minutes to an hour. I can handle that. I don't have to know <laughs> anything more. They already know. Um, but, the, you know, the same goes to you. There's there's a little bit of a vacuum in the Capital District now when it comes to orthodontic, orthodontic care. And, and uh, you know, the practice you have is very successful. You're, you were you were a brand. You were well known, very popular, and, and you did a great job with your patients. Um, you know, I, I think I did try to refer a couple of people to you over the years, like neighbors and things like that. They were mm -hmm. looking for an orthodontist. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so he's, you, know, you looks like you'd move on to, to great things down there in Florida. And um, you know, I'm happy happy for you and your success. Um, you can tell Kendall, right, it's your youngest daughter. Yeah, Kendall's the youngest. Yep, youngest daughter. Yeah, you can tell her I still hate the Yankees. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It might not be the year to, uh, she might get a little leverage on that one. Um, although now we're, we're big Gator fans now we're with Gianna as a Gator. Yeah. It's, uh, that's taken on a life. Now that you get down here, they just, they're not kidding. It's religion in the South. When you went to our first yeah, Gator, yeah, Gator, Gator a, game a, a couple cultish. weeks ago and, Oh, it's, it's, it's something. So, uh, it's, it's fun, but no, I always enjoy speaking to you and right. I appreciate the kind words. That's very nice of you. And actually the episode that is launching, this week, which is yours is launching next week, uh, could come out, um, is interesting because it's on a lot about the life decisions that you just alluded to. And, uh, I'll, I'll send you a link to it because it's, it's sure, another great. dentist. He's an ended honest. It's nothing technical. It's nothing about teeth. It's all about just kind yeah. of, um, uh, life and life decisions and how I made the decision I made and what led to that and where I am now. And, um, yeah, you know, I, I, miss the community in, in terms of the services I was able to provide. And it was a hard decision. It really was. Sure. Um, and I, I appreciate the kind words. It means a lot to, yeah. to hear that, especially that, that I've not been there uh, for, for people to feel that way. So thank you. Yeah. No problem, Mike. Yeah. No, awesome. Good, Great catching good, up with you, Kevin. Good, good talk, Mike. Same Say hi to everybody for me. Keep doing awesome with everything and, and can't tell you much how much I appreciate it. Thank you for tuning into this episode of the Doc Podcast. Be sure to visit theorthocoach.com to get access to ADA SERP recognized CE courses or to schedule a private one on one coaching session with me. Also, if you know of someone who would make a great guest for this show, or if you'd like to be a guest yourself, please email me at drmike at theorthocoach.com. And be sure to join the Doc community on Facebook for more great content. Thanks so much for listening and always remember you have been blessed with the ability to do amazing things.